did bring something, and I brought something I think you guys are going to really like. You saw it? You did? Is it something y'all like? Oh, I know what it is. Candy. Look what I brought with me. I got a whole bunch. I got a whole bunch of this. Look. Do you guys like this? M&M's. M&M's. What are M&M's? Look. Chocolate candies. Who likes chocolate? Yeah, but um, I think I brought the right stuff then because this is chocolate candies. And so I was thinking, look, 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 look right here. Milk chocolate made with real milk chocolate. Oh, I bet they're good. Do you think they're good? Yes. Do you want to find out? It would be even better if it was white chocolate. White, you like white chocolate? I like white chocolate too. But this is milk chocolate. Who wants, who wants to have some? Me, me. You think your parents will be okay? I think they'll be fine. I think it'll be okay. Yeah. All right, hold it. Hold out your hands. We want some. Well, come here if you want some. All right, come here. <laughs> they look like you want some? Wait, don't eat them. Really? What is it? Rocks. Rocks? <laughs> what? <laughs> there were rocks in there? <laughs> but, but. Well, it says chocolate. Don't, don't eat it. You eat a rock? It's really hard. Huh? You have eaten a rock before? No, no I hit it. Oh, okay. Shoo. It's really you, you made me hard. scared. Really yeah, hard. it is really hard. It's well, rough. well. In here. I don't know. That's no good, is it? No. Would you rather? Would you rather? Ha would you rather have chocolate? Yes. Yes. Well, it says chocolate on the outside, but is it chocolate on the inside? Here, let me have them, because you can't, let me have them. All right. If it, but it says it on the outside, does the inside matter? No. Does it matter if it's rocks on the inside, or should it be chocolate on the inside? It should be chocolate, shouldn't it? Yeah. Well, you know what? what? I think that we think about candy and stuff just like God thinks about us. Did you know, hey, hey, did, you, did you know that God thinks about us the exact same way, that he says what's on the inside matters, and it's not just what's on the outside. And I wanted to read you a verse in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and it's part of verse 7, okay? And listen to this, it says, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And that means that God is most concerned about what's on the inside. He says it doesn't matter as much what the package says. It doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. It's what's in our heart. It's what's on the inside that matters most. And so it doesn't matter. We can't say we're a Christian just because we go to a church or we, nice, we wear nice clothes on Sunday or because we say or do things a certain way. God says what's most important is what's in your heart and that you've asked for forgiveness and you've asked Jesus into your heart. He says what's on the inside matters most. Why do you get us rocks to eat? I know. Well, you don't want rocks, do you? No. No. Well, you know what? I've got some that have what's on the outside matches what's on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so it says there's milk chocolate, and there's milk chocolate in there. I hope, okay? there's, I hope there's not rocks. I hope not, too. <laughs> I hope not, too. All right. So what we're going to do? In a, in a minute, there are like scams. How you, like, actually close the rack? I know. I'll tell you later. Okay. All right. So. Let's have the pastor pray for us, and after he's done praying, you guys can get some real chocolates, okay? But if you promise to save them for after church and whatever your family says, you can eat them, okay? All right? Promise? Promise. Okay. All right. Let's have the pastor pray for us. Lord, we know that you look in our hearts, and we're glad of that today. We pray that we, too, will know that what's on the inside truly matters. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that doesn't have you in their heart today, would you speak to them this morning and come into their lives so that they would have what they need on the inside also. In Jesus' name we pray.
thank him for blessing me. I can never thank him enough for what he's done for me and my family. Amen. If the Lord took me out tomorrow, I can say that I've been blessed in my life. I love him. I'm thankful so much that he loved me as much as he did that he would go through all the things that he went through, that he would make it possible for me to be a part of his kingdom and see him for who he is one day. You know, this song says, I'm the one. We don't know, we don't really understand exactly what he did go through, physically and mentally. But he did it for you, and he did it for me. Amen. And if it was just me, he would have done it. If it was just you, he would have done it. So I'm so thankful. Now listen to the words. <laughs> There lays the crown that fell from his head. Oh, the blood is dry on the thorns. And there are the sandals they took from his feet. See how they're dusty. And warm. There stands the mother in tears for she's just lost her son. He died on the cross for someone he didn't know. And I just read. I'm the one I'm the one he shed his life's blood to save and I'm the reason he rose from the grave and I'm the reason for those worn out sandals he walked every mile just for me. Yes, he did. When I remember all the times I refused all the love that he offered me I just couldn't see how the sinner I was could be changed by his agony oh but now it's so clear I'm pardoned by God's only Son. He died on the cross for someone he didn't know. And I just realized I'm the one. I'm the one he shed his life's blood save and I'm the reason he rose from the grave and I'm the reason for those worn out sandals you see he walked every mile just for me Jesus walked every mile just for me.
Let's turn today to the book of Luke, chapter 8. Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, beginning with verse number 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over into the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. May the Lord add his blessings to his word today. In these verses, Luke is telling us the story of what happened on a certain day. It's a story that starts out simply enough. Jesus and his disciples, they get in a ship and he tells them, Let's go to the other side of the lake. Pretty simple, right? Yeah, he wasn't asking them to do anything complicated, anything extremely difficult. And so they launched forth. They launched out. No doubt feeling good. No doubt feeling confident and hopeful about the trip. And everything started out fine. But as they were sailing along, Luke tells us that things began to change. First, Jesus falls asleep. He falls asleep on them. Uh, Mark's account, Mark's gospel, tells us that he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep, sleeping. So he's not right there with them uh, to provide leadership, to give them comfort and reassurance. Next, a storm of wind comes down on the lake. And again, Mark says that it was a great storm that caused the waves to beat into the ship and to fill it with water. They were in jeopardy, Luke says there in the last part of verse number 23. They thought they were going to die. They thought they were about to perish. Fortunately, they did the right thing. And really the only thing they could do, they go and they wake up Jesus. They go and get Jesus. And so the Lord gets up. But I want you to notice that he was not the least bit disturbed by this storm. The storm is not what woke him up. Okay? He did not respond to the wind or the waves. No, he responded to the cries of his people. Just like he does now. And so he rebukes the wind and the raging water and there immediately was a calm. It must have been like going from 60 to zero just like that. I mean, one second everything is raging and roaring all around them and the next it's completely quiet and still, peaceful and calm. Oh, what a wonderful testament to the power of Jesus Christ to transform our lives, to change our situation completely and instantly. But what I want us to notice today and to really see is the question that Jesus asked his disciples after this calm came. There in verse number 25 he says, Where is your faith? Where is your faith? So this whole incident on the lake had left him wondering 
where their faith was. This incident had brought their faith into question. And the same is true in our lives. It is times like this that put our faith to the test. Times when we're in jeopardy. Those times when trouble comes along out of nowhere, like a storm of wind coming across the lake. It catches us off guard. I mean, there we are just sailing along. It's just a simple journey. We're just trying to make it to the other side, and bam, it hits us. We may be rocked to our core. We may feel completely overwhelmed. The ship is filling up, and it's filling up fast. And the right thing to do, and possibly the only thing that we can do, is go to Jesus. Call out to Jesus. Cry out to Him for His help, just like they did. And yet, He still asked them this question, didn't He? He still wanted to know where their faith was. Now, why would He do that? Why did he ask them this? Especially since it looks like they did the right thing. They had just done the right thing by going to him and asking for his help. Why would he ask that? Well, it's because moments like this one, days like this certain day are meant to expose our faith. In other words, the storms of life The troublesome times that come, they should reveal our faith. They should confirm our faith, not call our faith into question. See, it doesn't take a lot of faith when there's smooth sailing. When you're going along and everything is bright and sunny. Oh, but faith should be most visible when we're in jeopardy. Faith should be easiest to see when the dark times come. So how we respond to adversity in our lives should have us saying, there is my faith, not where is my faith. It ought to be demonstrated, not disappear when challenges come. But you know, after the past year and a half that we've had, that we've been through, we might want to ask ourselves this same question. A big storm of wind came along in March of last year, and it is still beating against us today. It has been a tremendous challenge. It really has. It has put everything in jeopardy, including our lives. But how have we responded to this? Have we responded in faith or out of fear? The reason he asked them this, this question, if you look in verse 25, it says, and they being afraid. He asked them this because they were afraid. So he said, where's your faith? Which have we demonstrated? Which have we shown? Folks, we have been given a very unique opportunity to show the world what it really means to live by faith. We have. Have we done that? Are we doing that? Where is our faith? To truly answer that, we need to know three things about our faith. Number one, we need to know its location. What is the location of our faith? In verse 25, it says, Jesus said unto them, Where is your faith? Now when he was asking them this question, he was essentially letting them know, Hey, guys, I don't really see your faith right now. It should be here. It should be on display right now, here in this ship, but... I'm not seeing it. I don't see your faith. So where is it exactly? Have you misplaced it somehow? Did you maybe leave it on the other side of the lake or something? Where is it? What the Lord was pointing out to them 
is that real faith needs to be seen. Real faith has to be lived out. James said, I will show thee my faith by my works. I will show you my faith. Is our faith showing? Can it be seen? The answer depends in large part on its location. Where do we put our faith? Where do we locate our faith? Well, we basically have two choices. We can either put our faith in God or we can put our faith in man. And that's it. Which should we choose? Well, the psalmist said in the very central verse of the Bible, the very middle verse, the very heart of God's Word, the psalmist said this. He said, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. How true that is. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So who do we believe? Who are we going to listen to? Which one is truly worthy of our faith? There are so many voices out there right now that are competing for our attention, that are seeking our approval and seeking our confidence. They want us to believe them. It can be really hard to know what to believe anymore and who to trust. Well, I'll tell you what I've done. I have come to the same conclusion that Paul did. And I have said, let God be true but every man a liar. That's it. That's what I'm going with. Let God be true, but every man a liar. In other words, my faith is in Him. I am trusting God to take care of me and my family. I am trusting Him to get us through this. That no matter how fiercely the storm may rage, no matter how long it may go on, the location of my faith will not change. That it will remain right where it is, always and forever the anchor of my soul. Where is our faith? We need to know its location. But not only that, we also need to know its vocation. To truly know where our faith is is more than just knowing its location, more than just knowing where we've put it. We also need to know what our faith is doing. What is it accomplishing? Jesus told his disciples that all we need to do great things is to have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. So that's all we need, and that we would be able to move mountains in our lives. He said nothing would be impossible to us. He said that all things would be possible to him that believes. So just a tiny, tiny amount of faith can be such a powerful thing. Just the tiniest amount can open doors and change our lives. So is that what we're doing with our faith? Has it moved any mountains for us lately? Have we seen things that we thought were impossible take place? Things we thought couldn't happen, but did. Or do we maybe find ourselves in a bit of a dry spell when it comes to works of faith? The mountains just won't budge. The obstacles and the hindrances, they won't go away. And so we might begin to wonder, does my faith still work? Does it accomplish anything? Or am I just wasting my time trying to hold on to something that's gone, that has been used up? Well, I can tell you this, that's exactly what the devil wants us to believe, okay? He wants us to believe that it does no good to believe. That it does no good to pray. He says it's all in vain. It's all a waste of time. So you should just give up. You should just 
forget it. But here's the thing about faith. If we want it to work, then we have to use it. If we want our faith to work, we got to put it to use. Because you see, faith is very much like a muscle. In that the more you use it, the bigger it gets. And the stronger it grows. Whereas the less that we use it, the smaller it gets. And the weaker it becomes. Faith's like a muscle. And so that means if we tell one of our mountains to move. Remove mountain. But it don't. It won't go away. We can't just give up. We can't just shrug our shoulders and hang our head and walk away in defeat. My wife can tell you that I am probably the world's worst when it comes to wanting and expecting things to work the first time. I admit it. It's very true. If I'm putting it together or I'm trying to fix it one time, I figure that ought to be enough. Am I the only one here? I have invested as much of my life into restoring or uh, repairing this thing that I feel I should. And so I get pretty frustrated and pretty aggravated when it doesn't work out that way. But I think we all know it seldom does. Things seldom work the first time. It may require many attempts on our part to get the results that we're looking for. Well, listen, moving our mountains may be the same way. It may take the same thing. Maybe you've been praying about something for a long time. Maybe you've been pushing against this thing for a long time. But it won't budge. It won't move. It won't go away. My friend, keep praying. Keep pushing. Keep putting your faith to work. We need to know the location of our faith. We need to know the vocation of our faith. And lastly, we also need to know the foundation of our faith. Last thing we need to know where our faith is, what's it built on? What's it made of? Jesus told a parable about a wise man and a foolish man. He said that the wise man built his house on the rock. And the foolish man built his house on the sand. And then the storms came. Just like this storm that came down on the lake that day. The rains fell, the floods came up, the winds blew, and they beat on both of their houses. The wise man's house didn't fall. Wise man's house stood strong. It withstood the beating of the storm. But the foolish man's house, it fell. And great was the fall of it, Jesus said. Same storm. Same troubles came to both men. But only one's house survived. The one who built on the rock. And Jesus said that in order for us to be like the wise man in that parable, then we have to hear his sayings and do them. We have to, in other words, believe his word and keep his word. Folks, this is the rock that we have to build our lives upon. This is the foundation, the true foundation of our faith. God's word won't wash away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his words shall never pass away. God's word will still be standing when this world is on fire. His word is forever settled in heaven. Just as it should also be settled in our hearts today. Oh, it's forever settled. Let there be no doubts about it. Let there be no uncertainties at all. May we stand firm on our solid foundation. So to know where our 
faith is, we should ask ourselves this. How firm am I? How firm am I? I mean, we know the foundation's firm, but are we? We know that the rock we're standing on can't be moved, but can we? Can we be moved? Even as he was bound in the spirit for Jerusalem, not knowing what would befall him there, the Apostle Paul still declared, but none of these things move me. None of this stuff is going to move me. I have made the choice, I have made the decision to build everything on this rock. And this is where I am going to stay. Where is your faith? Where is my faith? Is it where it should be? Is it truly where God wants it to be? To really know, we have to know its location. Have we put our faith in God? Not man. And what about its vocation? Is your faith working? Are we using it like we should? And how firmly have we made our stand on God's Word? The foundation of our faith. When the storms come, when we're in jeopardy, when we're in trouble, our faith should be on display. It shouldn't disappear. The Lord shouldn't have to ask, where is your faith? Our life should show it, just like James said. Our actions should say, here, here is my faith. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the good foundation that you have given to us to build our whole lives upon. That we know we'll never crack nor crumble stand forever Lord we've been in jeopardy for a while hard times have come our way it's been troublesome and we have had the opportunity to respond to these things for over a year and a half now I wonder Lord what would you say to us today Would you ask us this same question? Where is our faith? Or would you be able to see our faith? What about those around us today, Lord? What kind of witness have we been for you? I pray that you would encourage our hearts today, that you would strengthen us in our faith and our commitment to you, to live for you, to stand for you, to remain steadfast through every dark time, every hard time that might come our way. I pray you speak to hearts now, Lord, that you would deal with us in your way, your loving way, and draw us, Lord. May we do what you would have us do here today. Let you have your way with us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
in darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god and all my they were singing that I was thinking how that relates to this scripture today and the thought came to my mind I've never had to ask God where's your faith I've never had to question him and his faithfulness to me he has been so so good just like this song says I wish I could say the same that I had always been faithful to him but I have failed him every day so glad he loves us, aren't you? Has he spoke to you today about anything in your life that he wants you to, to deal with? He wants to help you to deal with? Maybe to move up closer to him, be more faithful than you are? I never want to get to the place where I say, I'm close enough. That I've attained... Even Paul couldn't say that, so I know I can't. What about us? Where's our faith today? Maybe God wants it to be a little bigger, a little stronger than it is right now. If he's speaking to you this morning, I encourage you. Come to him. He's always been so good, so faithful to you and me. Let's be faithful to him. I can certainly do that. Every breath I have, I could praise him. Talk about how good he's been to me, and I'm sure you feel the same. My hearts and minds clear today. Amen. Thank you for coming.
It's good, it's good to see each one here. God bless you. Hope to see you next time.